So I guess we'll we'll jump right in and kind of start looking at the snakes of Florida. Uh, so we're, we'll start out talking about what snakes are and what snakes aren't. Um, a quick little look at snake evolution and kind of when snakes um, appeared on the scene. Um, and then the bulk of the talk will be kind of going through some of the species that are in Florida. Um, some of the most common ones that uh, many of you have probably seen, and then some of the more interesting ones. Uh, and then we'll take a little segue and kind of look at some of the cool snake behaviors uh, that you can see out there. So what makes a snake a snake? Um, I mean, the obvious one is a lack of legs, uh, but there's plenty of critters out there that don't have legs. Um, you know, what makes a snake different from a worm? Um, so are they vertebrates or invertebrates? Um, you know, worms do not have any bones, no backbone in there. They're completely squishy, whereas snakes are vertebrates. They have bones. Um, and then are snakes slimy? Uh, no, they've got dry, scaly skin. Uh, so they're reptiles. Uh, their uh, skin doesn't really let, you know, gases exchange across the skin like a fish or an amphibian, uh, which would be more slimy and wet. <laughs> Um, so what are snakes? Snakes are elongated, limbless, ectothermic, carnivorous reptiles. Uh, so it's a lot of big words. Let's start breaking some of those down. Snakes, uh, pretty much, they always have this relatively long body plan. They're always elongate. Um, they do not have any limbs, uh, though we will take a look at a fossil snake that kind of gives us some evidence as to how that happened, how they went from having limbs originally to what we now know as snakes. Um, so that next word, ectothermic. Well, ecto kind of means outside as opposed to endo, and thermic kind of sounds like thermal, doesn't it? So that has to do with heat. So they get their heat from outside their bodies. Um, we used to use the term cold-blooded, um, but there are some animals that kind of blur the lines there between cold-blooded and warm-blooded. They kind of generate some of their own heat sometimes, um, and so now we kind of use the terms ectothermic and endothermic. Uh, and then that last one, carnivorous, uh, basically just means there aren't any vegetarian snakes out there eating plants as their main diet. Uh, so there are 3,600 species of snakes on earth, so between 3,000 and 4,000 species, with most of those living near the equator. So you get your highest diversity in Central and South America, Central Africa, Southeast Asia, and Australia. And in the US, that really means you get a lot of snakes in Florida, Texas, Arizona, kind of those southern states. So let's take a look at some of that diversity that snakes have around the world. So some snakes are constrictors, like this tree boa. Um, you know, this is from Central America. They live in the jungle. They use their powerful muscles to squeeze their prey. And then, you know, while some sm snakes live in trees, there are others that live in the ocean, never seeing a tree. This sea crate here has evolved this flat paddle-like tail to help it swim. And so it can kind of swim really fast with this little paddle as opposed to just like a long, like a string-like tail that wouldn't give it much uh, motion in the water. And this can actually be seen diving down to hunt on coral reefs, even over a hundred feet deep out in uh, places like Indonesia, where I saw this one. Some snakes have intricate patterns and colors that help them camouflage um, in different environments, like this lichen snail eater that looks spectacular up close, but from, from afar, it just perfectly blends in with its mossy jungle sort of habitat. Some snakes are venomous, uh, using toxins to catch and subdue their prey, and also occasionally for defense. So there are mildly venomous snakes that rarely bite people, and might only feel like a bee sting, uh, like this blunt-headed tree snake. And then there are the dangerously venomous species. The ones we're most familiar with, especially in the United States, are the vipers. Uh, so the vipers uh, include this brightly colored eyelash pit viper, um, but they also include those cryptic masters of camouflage, the rattlesnakes. So many snakes, especially the vipers, are famously good ambush hunters sitting and waiting for prey to get too close, and then they strike. So here, a young rattlesnake has just bitten a lizard with a bright blue belly. 
And, you know, the first thing you saw with this picture is probably this lizard. Your eye gets drawn to his bright blue belly. The lizard would usually use that, you know, for kind of a breeding display. Uh, and now it's on its back here because hidden up here in the corner is a young rattlesnake. Very difficult to see. He's even got his little yellow rattle here and here's his head. Um, and so the rattlesnake has bitten this lizard, injected some venom, and is now just kind of waiting back for the lizard to die so that it can eat in peace without the lizard fighting back. So letting their venom kill their prey means that snakes can target relatively large animals, um, you know, without kind of incurring any damage from their prey. Uh, and these animals can sometimes be, you know, it's so big that it looks like they're too big to swallow, at least for us. You know, this lizard here, that's quite a mouthful. It's, you know, able to stretch its scales a little bit. So you can even see the blue lizard belly like in its throat. And then even bigger, here's another rattlesnake eating a large rat. Um, so how do snakes swallow such large prey items? Uh, imagine trying to open your mouth wide enough to swallow like a grapefruit whole. You know, you just can't do it. Um, you know, don't go and try, just take my word for it. Human jaws are not arranged in the same way as snake jaws. Uh, not only can snakes open their mouth down more than we can, but their lower jaws are not connected at the front like ours are. You know, our chins here, they're kind of fused right there. So you, you know, we can only kind of open our mouths up and down. But with snakes, their jaws can open down and then spread apart like this. So you may notice we've got these extra rows of teeth up on the roof of the snake's mouth. And those rows of teeth can actually kind of walk back and forth so that when the snake opens its mouth really wide and gets a good hold on its prey item, you know, it doesn't have any arms. It can't use a fork and knife. It can't shovel that food into its mouth. Those teeth on the roof of its mouth kind of walk the prey item down its throat without needing any hands. A little bit terrifying, kind of alien and predator-esque, uh, but very cool, especially when you get to see a, a neat CT scan like this one. Uh, this is of a python here. So now we've got an idea of what snakes are and what they can look like. Uh, so how long have snakes been around? You know, they, they kind of look prehistoric. You know, you think of snakes almost, you know, kind of like dinosaurs. Um, and so when did snakes evolve? Uh, the earliest fossils of snakes come from around 150 million years ago. So that's right in the middle of the reign of the dinosaurs. Um, and then after there, they diversify and spread around uh, mo mostly when the dinosaurs went extinct about 66 million years ago. And so we have some sparse fossils from that whole mil 100 million year period uh, of snakes and snake-like reptiles. And then after the dinosaurs disappeared, there are a lot more niches to fill. So here is one of those early fossil snakes. And if we take a really close look, we can see tiny little legs. Look at those little feet. They're basically useless in there. And using a combination of fossil and DNA evidence, we can say that snakes originally had limbs, um, you know, would look more like a lizard. And then over millions of years of natural selection, those limbs essentially shrank until they disappeared entirely. Uh, so if you take an x-ray of some of modern snakes today, you can actually see little vestigial structures where their hind limbs used to be uh, many millions of years ago. Um, and, but what's the advantage of losing your limbs? You know, I feel like, you know, hands are pretty useful. It's, it's nice to be able to grab things, to walk, um, but, you know, a lot of creatures kind of disagree with that. Um, snakes are not the only animals to have reduced or lost their limbs. There are multiple lineages of fish, such as eels, that have reduced fins and look a lot like snakes. Um, this guy middle on the left is a little swamp eel, independently evolved from things like moray eels, um, but it has the same sort of eel body plan. Some large salamanders, like this siren here, have lost their hind limbs and then reduced their fore forelimbs to basically be better at swimming. Um, you know, it streamlines the body and then you've got this nice powerful tail that you can use to swim 
and you can slide in around uh, maybe grass or underground and the limbs are just getting in the way uh, with that sort of environment. Uh, lizards like skinks here on the bottom left, um, they often have very small limbs. Uh, and then some lizards have gone all the way to having no limbs. So this here on the top right is a glass lizard. Um, and they, you have them in Florida. I found this one in Tampa last year. And they look a lot like a snake. But if you take a closer look, you'll kind of notice some weird things about it. Uh, their face just looks more like a lizard face for some reason. They don't really have a neck. It's just kind of a lizard head plopped onto a snake body. Uh, the big one, the big way to really ID them, if you're unsure, is lizards have ear holes and snakes don't. So this glass lizard actually has ear holes here, uh, like an external ear opening, and no snake is going to have that. So there are dozens of separate instances um, in evolutionary history of lineages of animals reducing and subsequently losing their limbs. And this is called convergent evolution, uh, when unrelated organisms have similar traits due to similar pressures, such as the benefit of slithering or swimming through water or sand and loose soil. Another interesting in, uh, instance of convergent evolution that we can see uh, with snakes uh, is one we can see with fossorial species of snakes. So fossorial, again, so it sounds like fossil, sounds like underground. Fossorial means these snakes live underground. And the convergence that I'm looking at here is in their noses. So here we've got the leaf-nosed snake with this little kind of fat pad on its nose. And then we've got the long-nosed snake, just has a slightly pointier nose than something like a water snake. Um, continuing clockwise, the shovel nose snake, kind of a much pointier nose here. And then the scarlet snake, which is the one of these four that you can see in Florida. And all of these have tougher, pointier snouts that aid in digging in sand or loose dirt. And they're not related species, uh, but because they live underground and like to kind of almost swim through the sand, they have evolved these similar little noses that help them do that. So now we've got some background on what snakes are, some of their uh, adaptations, a little of their anatomy. And mostly I wanna take us on a journey through some of the most common species of snakes that we can see in Florida. So one of the most common snakes in the state right here, the banded water snake. These guys are very variable. Um, they're pretty much found wherever there's fresh water. Um, I'm, most of you have probably all seen a banded water snake at some point, whether it's in a retention pond or a nice stream or a swamp somewhere. The Everglades is full of them. Um, these are one of the most common species of snakes in the state. Another type of water snake um, is the Florida green water snake, kind of, a, kind of an olive, olive green sort of color. Uh, a bit less common in my experience than the banded water snake, but still generally associated with water. And then there's the brown water snake. Um, they've got kind of a weird head and little beady eyes, in my opinion. I feel like that's the way to really identify them. Their head looks kind of weird. Um, and none of these water snakes are venomous. Uh, so we'll take a look at the venomous snakes in a few minutes. Uh, and especially we'll take a minute to tell the difference between these harmless water snakes and the venomous cottonmouth, which they kind of look pretty similar to. So here's another cool snake closely related to the water snakes. This one, you can actually find it closer to mangroves and like salt marsh sort of habitat closer to the beach. Um, this is the mangrove salt marsh snake. It's kind of a, a subspecies or hybrid, depending on what papers you read. Um, of a species of water snake. And they're also very variable, but they can be this beautiful orange color with these little light bands on them. Um, and here, this one is just hanging out on these sandy mud flats of a brackish lagoon in Florida. Uh, I think these ones are actually on, on Honeymoon Island out there, uh, a bit north of Whedon Island. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much the only snake you're going to see 
um, just kind of crawling along a brackish habitat like this. So two of the smaller snakes you can find in Florida. Uh, these are both relatively common if you put in some effort to find them. We've got the pine woods litter snake, just kind of a solid rusty brown color, and the ringneck snake. Viewed from above, it's just kind of a solid gray, but its belly is this fiery orange red, and it's got that diagnostic little orange collar around its neck there. Uh, you generally don't run across these guys unless you are flipping a lot of logs and rocks in the woods, so looking under leaf litter, uh, really making an effort to actually find little critters like this. And they definitely you know, are completely harmless. They, I've never had one even try to bite me, uh, even if you do pick them up. They're just so tiny, they could barely get their mouth around your finger. Uh, same goes for the Florida brown snake. Very small, well camouflaged. Uh, you probably won't see it unless you're really looking for it. Um, you know, just solid brown here. And pretty much I only ever find it under logs. On the other hand, so this species is probably the most commonly seen snake during the daytime, especially away from water. This is the black racer. Uh, it's very fast. It's diurnal, meaning it is day active, not night active. Um, and it can get a few feet long. It's very, very fast, um, which helps it hunt lizards, kind of one of its main prey items. Um, and it can be found in even like in the suburbs. You know, we had black racers right around our apartment in Tampa um, when I was in Florida last year. Um, and generally, they will speed away from you way faster than you can catch them. You know, even if you go after them, they'll just disappear into the bushes. But if they're cornered or you try to handle them, they can be a bit feisty um, and they will bite. They're not venomous, um, but they will definitely bite if you try and pick one up. So, you know, it's always better, always better to leave snakes alone, observe from a distance. So here I'm gonna stop for a second and try to get this video to come up because it's pretty cool. Um, let's see if this video will open for me. There we go. So, sorry for the delay. We've got this video clip here and I'll just fill this screen with it. So here's a black racer. There we go. So here we can kind of see that walking of, you know, the left and right side of the jaws walking a prey item into its mouth. Um, and so this is a skink that this black racer had caught. This is at Brooker Creek uh, Preserve. And here, I'll back it back up. And so we can see, you know, skinks are fast, but the black racers are even faster. And so this, you know, these are lizards that are one of their main prey items. And man, they just, he is just walking his jaws down that lizard's body to swallow it. It's, it's just crazy. <laughs> so. Go back into here. Oop. And of course, I left the video on. There we go. Let's see. Okay. And we're back. <laughs> so, another fast diurnal snake, uh, similar in some aspects to the Black Racer, is the Coach Whip. Um, this one is a bit more picky about its habitat than the racer. You probably won't find it in the suburbs. It's definitely less common. Uh, it likes sandy scrub habitat, kind of more in central Florida usually, though it can be found um, uh, kind of all over the state as long as it's got the right nice sandy habitat. Um, very fast species, uh, but differentiated by the black racer, um, definitely in part by this brown sort of back end. The black racer is you know, black or dark gray all the way down its body. The coach whip kind of fades into this cool tan uh, coloration. The garter snake, a uh, relatively common species in a variety of habitats, also can be found in the suburbs. Um, you know, this is pretty much the gentle sort of snake people see in their backyards a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, definitely not venomous, not harmful at all. But I will say, if you pick one up, they are the stinkiest things on the planet. They are just so smelly. 
It is like holding a little skunk in your hand. They will make your hands smell awful for hours and hours, no matter how many times you wash your hands. So again, better to look than to handle. Um, they are very smelly. Very similar to the garter snake. Here we've got the ribbon snake, um, a bit more slender. And the position of the stripes is a little different. You know, you've got kind of a browner dorsal stripe here, and then these whiter instead of yellower stripes are kind of on the sides. Uh, whereas with the garter snake, you get kind of more of a checker pattern sometimes. It's not usually as defined with the stripes, uh, but they can be pretty similar. They're in the same genus, they're closely related. Um, but so the garter and the ribbon snake are both relatively common snakes you can find in uh, suburbs, small parks, things like that. So the corn snake, this one's a decently large species. You know, it can get a few feet long, it can be quite beautiful. I mean, this one is just this coppery orange color. Um, you know, and as such, some people keep these ones as pets, um, but you know, in my opinion, you know, wild animals should be left alone in the wild, definitely not taken and kept as pets. Um, you know, there's that classic saying, the old adage, you know, take only pictures, leave only footprints. It's a good, good thing to hold to uh, when you're hiking around in the wilderness. The corn snake though, here a baby corn snake looks quite different than the adult. Um, this kind of more pinkish white color instead of the orange, um, you know, might be confusing as to, you know, this here turns into that. So it's really interesting how variable these snakes can be, both with age and also um, even as adults, they can be pretty uh, differently colored uh, between individuals. Uh, another pretty variable species, these are rat snakes. Um, up north, generally farther north out of Florida, uh, you know, Georgia up through New England, uh, a lot of times the rat snake you'll see is going to be this jet black, very large black snake. Um, whereas in Florida, you can often see the yellow rat snake or something much more brown, kind of a mustard color. Um, and sometimes they can even be bright yellow. You know, here's this nice striped yellow rat snake here. Um, so again, quite variable, uh, but they're large, um, pretty thick bodied, though we'll look at the venomous snakes in a bit and you'll see the difference um, just in kind of the body shape here. But um, yeah, the rat snake is another cool, relatively common species that you can see throughout Florida. Here's that fossorial scarlet snake with its pointy digging nose. Um, and then you'll of course notice its color pattern, which is reminiscent of that famous venomous coral snake. Uh, and that's no accident, you know, it didn't just happen to be red, black, and yellow. The scarlet snake is one of many species that are non-venomous, but mimic the coral snake's red, black, and yellow pattern. Um, and that's kind of as protection from predators, you know, if you're a bird going after a snake for food and you think that that snake might be venomous, you know, you see the red, black, and yellow, you're gonna leave it alone. You know, you don't wanna risk it because the coral snake is a deadly species. And so this type of mimicry where this scarlet snake is non-venomous, mimicking an actually dangerous host is called Batesian mimicry. Um, and so that's this kind of mimicry here where it looks like the coral snake, Batesian mimicry. Uh, these scarlet snakes, they like sandy scrub, open woodlands, uh, but they're rarely seen above ground during the day. You know, usually they're down under the leaf litter, buried in kind of the sandy habitat, again, using that little pointy nose to, uh, to kind of dig through the sand. And then these two snakes, they're possibly, you know, a couple of my favorites to find in Florida. Uh, they're just so colorful. The rough green snake, um, you know, against a white background, it's just this gorgeous green, but it is amazingly camouflaged in tall grass or even up in leafy trees and bushes. They can be seen kind of up off the ground sometimes. Uh, while the scarlet snake is another one of those Batesian mimics of the coral snake. Uh, you may have heard the old saying, red against black, venom lack, and red against yellow, kill a fellow. So here, you know, we've got red stripes touching the black stripes, not touching the yellow. So 
that's kind of one way to know that this uh, snake is non-venomous. It's not the coral snake. But there are exceptions to that rule. And so that saying does not always work. Um, aberrant color morphs of e either the, the king snake or the venomous coral snake can render these rhymes useless. Um, and then if you go outside the US down to Central and South America, then the rule completely falls apart. Then there's coral snakes that are totally different colors, king snakes of different colors. And so it's really better to just you know, leave them be, enjoy from a distance. Um, if you have to use that rhyme to be sure, then you probably shouldn't be touching the snake at all in the first place. So here, you know, take a look at the scarlet king snake, that nice pattern, and then we'll compare that to the coral snake. Again, here's the real thing, the venomous coral snake. The red stripes are touching the yellow in this case, um, but it's that's really not the best way to go about memorizing um, or identifying these guys. Um, and even though it is venomous, it's very shy, uh, typically stays underground, it's very rarely seen. Um, and even if they are seen, they're not gonna go after you. Uh, you know, they're just gonna kind of disappear back under the leaf litter. Um, and so just enjoy from a distance if you get to see one of these guys, it's a rare treat. A much more commonly seen venomous snake in Florida is the water moccasin or Florida cottonmouth. Um, so these are vipers here, well camouflaged ambush predators, generally hanging out near fresh water. Uh, on the left, we have a young one, more boldly patterned uh, than the old kind of more uniform grayer one here on the right, but they're both the same species, the cottonmouth. And here, let's compare it to that, the banded water snake, the Florida water snake here. Um, and so we've got the harmless little water snake on the left, and the potentially dangerous cottonmouth on the right. Uh, there's a number of ways to tell them apart, but honestly, it's still just safer to stand back and not handle it at all. Um, and, you know, here we've got kind of a big triangular head and a thick fat body, but the, the water snake can be pretty fat, honestly, and they can kind of spread out. If they're scared and they want to look big, they can look especially fat and they can look like they have a pretty triangular head. Um, so not all, not all snakes with triangular heads are venomous. Um, and then not all snakes with vertical pupils are venomous. You know, that's also something that people talk about is, oh, if it's got a vertical pupil, you know, it's probably a viper, so it's going to be venomous. If you're close enough to see the pupils, you are too close to a snake that you cannot identify. So just, you know, back up and take some pictures. Here's another one of my absolute favorites, the dusky pygmy rattlesnake, uh, the smallest species of rattlesnake. Um, they often look like a little chocolate chip cookie or a pine cone just sitting on the side of the trail. Uh, they are venomous, you know, they're vipers, and they will sometimes rattle, um, but their rattles are so small that they are barely audible. It just makes this little zzzz. It sounds more like an insect than a dangerous snake. And if you're hiking on a trail, chances are you won't hear that. It's not going to alert you to its presence. Um, so if you're hiking out in, you know, maybe pine pine woods, something scrubby, uh, it's better to have some good boots on and to just kind of keep an eye on your feet rather than hope that it will uh, kind of sound off before you get too close. But again, they're not, not aggressive. They're not going to come after you. Um, I've walked, you know, right past these guys without seeing them. Um, and you know, they, they're not going to just lunge out and strike at you if you leave them alone. So the last of the four venomous snakes for central and southern Florida is also the largest, the eastern diamondback rattlesnake. Uh, well camouflaged, very powerful. This snake can get over five feet long. Uh, here's a little baby, but then here, you know, this is a much larger adult, a few feet long, uh, found in a variety of habitats commonly in the open palmetto scrub, uh, you know, sandy sort of habitat, maybe similar to the coach whips habitat. Uh, but it can also be found in wet forests and even in the mangroves. Uh, so you kind of have to be aware of this snake. And it, if it does rattle, it is much louder. You will definitely hear it. Um, but they don't always rattle. They don't have to rattle before they strike. So keep an eye on your feet and hands if you're out in the woods. Just always, it's always a good idea to be aware of your surroundings a bit. 
So who is this? This guy doesn't belong in Florida. This is the Burmese python, one of the introduced species that has invaded the ecosystem of Southern Florida. You hear about this guy in the news a lot around the Everglades, Miami, um, you know, people catching and trying to kill them because, you know, it's not really the snake's fault, but humans brought them here. Um, and now they are wreaking havoc on the Everglades ecosystem, eating um, small mammals and birds. And so if you can, um, you know, if you find one and catch one, then it is actually best to try and put it in a bag or something and take it to fish and wildlife, um, some sort of authorities where they will either euthanize it or uh, use it for education, you know, give it to a university or something. Um, these large constrictors, they're originally from Southeast Asia, um, which, you know, is kind of a similar sort of habitat in a lot of ways to Southern Florida. And without any natural predators around here, it's, you know, the Everglades is a good home for them. On the other end of the size spectrum, uh, here's another introduced species from Asia, this is the Brahmini blind snake. This tiny little worm-like snake, you know, they can be just a few inches long. Um, this is now the most widespread snake in the world. It has traveled around the globe in soil, often with imported garden plants, potting soil, um, and thus it's earned the nickname the flower pot snake. Um, and they can be locally abundant, uh, especially around suburban areas, around Miami, around Tampa. Um, and they're generally, they're hiding under logs. You know, they're also fossorial. Um, they don't need to see when they're underground. It's all dark. You know, you don't want the dirt getting in your eyes. So that's why they've evolved to be pretty much blind, though they still have a little bit of a pigment area here for where their eyes used to be. Um, but yeah, these guys can be quite abundant in some spots. Uh, just behind my apartment last year in Tampa, I found this little, little patch of woods and flipped over a log and there were four of these snakes under one log. Another cool thing about the blind snakes is the tip of their tails, they actually have this little spike. Um, and when you, you know, if you pick one up, they'll poke you with the spike, which, you know, they're so tiny, it doesn't really hurt at all, but it's a bit startling if you don't know what's coming. Um, so if you were a bird and you were to pick up one of these snakes, maybe you're just expecting a worm and all of a sudden it pokes you with something hard, you know, you might, you might drop it and kind of take, you know, have a second thought about eating that as your meal. So that's most of the snakes that you will probably run across in Florida. Um, there's definitely more. Um, you know, there's, there's over a dozen more species of snakes that I didn't cover, uh, but they're generally rarer. Um, and so now we're going to kind of move on to some of the cool behaviors that some of those snakes have. Uh, and so this here um, is, of course, the cottonmouth. Here we're, we've got that same old viper, the cottonmouth. We've talked about it a couple times. And here's why it's called the cotton mouth, because its little mouth here is lined with this bright white. And so when threatened, uh, the cottonmouth will open up its mouth, revealing that bright white interior. And it's probably, you know, it's probably meant to be a threat, probably similar to the rattlesnake's rattle, basically saying, hey, you know, don't step on me, don't eat me, I'm venomous, you know, just so we're clear. You know, you can see me, um, you know, I can hurt you if you start attacking me. Another weird behavior is that ringneck snake that, you know, the first picture I showed, it was just all gray. You could just see the kind of the yellow ring on its neck. Well, here it is upside down. You know, it's got this fiery belly. Uh, that back is good for camouflage. Um, but if it's threatened and something is picking it up, you know, probably a predator, but it could be some random naturalist that flipped a log and wanted to pick it up. The ringneck snake will play dead. It'll flip over, revealing that bright color on its belly. And so this act is often paired with kind of a stinky odor that it releases, similar to how a garter snake will stink your hands up if you pick it up. Um, and so these colors, it's probably also kind of a mimic of the coral snake. These are bright colors, the yellow and the red, that, and bright colors often mean danger or poison. Um, and so, but this ringneck snake, it's not venomous, it's not poisonous to eat. Uh, so the colors are probably just a bluff. Um, but another possible interpretation of the behavior is that it is playing dead 
And if it's also releasing some sort of a stinky odor, then maybe it's trying to basically say, oh, I'm, I'm already so long dead, I'm rotting. You know, you don't want to eat me. I'm not a good meal. And so maybe the predator, like a raccoon or a possum, will just kind of keep walking saying, ah, I don't want to eat that. I'll go find something fresh to eat. Um, and then on top of kind of showing off the colorful belly and playing dead, the ringneck snake will draw attention to its tail and then hide its head under a coil of its body so that even if a predator does bite it, its head, which is the most important part, kind of stays safe. You know, if we go back, that tail is super bright and curled up, kind of drawing a lot of attention to that tail. And then the head, they like to kind of tuck it under their body here. Somebody is mowing the lawn, like right outside the window. <laughs> um, our last example of a cool snake behavior is the combat dance seen in some species of vipers. So here we have a pair of pygmy rattlesnakes um, that are fighting over breeding rights for the females in an area. Uh, this combat dance is mesmerizing, like a full body thumb war with the snakes wrestling each other's heads to the ground, all intertwined. Um, and it's not necessarily a fast act. <laughs> I watched these two battling for over 30 minutes. Um, it's not fast paced at all, but it is pretty cool to watch. It is mesmerizing, uh, definitely. You know, that bigger individual here, he has the upper hand. Um, he keeps raising up and then kind of throwing the other one down to the ground and pushing him down. Um, and so eventually that big individual, I believe he won uh, most likely and then claimed the breeding rights in the area. And so here, um, we've got one more little video that's just a little clip, let's see, another little clip just to kind of show the movement and how it's not a fast paced battle, <laughs> not at all. But it's a really interesting behavior if you ever come across this in the wild, they're just wrapped up together. And, um, you know, it can look a lot like maybe they're mating, but in this case, you know, the vipers, rattlesnakes and cottonmouths will do this. Um, you know, I knew that they have this weird behavior. And so I knew that they were doing this combat dance and not mating. So these are two males here writhing around in the pine forest in Florida. Just, just a weird, weird behavior out there. Wee. <laughs> Yeah, so with that, whoops, yeah. So like I said, cottonmouths and uh, diamondbacks will also engage in this sort of behavior. So, you know, imagine instead of just the little pygmy rattlesnakes doing it, you have multi foot long snakes tossing each other around in the grass. It'd be pretty cool to watch. Mm -hmm.